thank you very much for having me here. Uh, thank you to C-SPAN for, for coming. And uh, I want to tell you, you've got a heck of a dean here. Uh, I've known Mike, as he mentioned, for a long, long time. And he taught me a great deal about writing. As a matter of fact, uh, the thing that he taught that was most important is uh, you've got to put passion in your writing. You can't just be sort of a boring person. You've got to, like, let it rip. And he, he actually uh, does that. And I, I have to tell you about one thing that blew my mind. He once wrote a book review about uh, this philosopher, Hegel, who, uh, if you think I'm going to put you to sleep, you should try reading Hegel. And this book review ended uh, with a passionate love scene between being and becoming, which is something this guy Hegel wrote, wrote about. So if you can write with passion and turn a philosopher's dry words into uh, uh, a love scene, well, you, you can write with passion. So I, I've never forgotten that, Mike. OK, we're dealing with tonight a, uh, let me see if I can uh, get this going here. Uh, why, why write a book like this? Uh, why write a book about earning a million dollars an hour. What I was trying to do uh, are three things. I'm trying to raise the most fundamental questions about how economic value is produced by Wall Street elites. What is it? What is it that they do that's so valuable? The second thing I wanted to look at is what are the root causes of the increasing inequality in our economy? It's, it's the, the gaps between the super rich and everybody else is growing. Where's that coming from? And I wanted to also, the third thing, was to kind of revisit the economic crash that happened in 2008 to see if we can get a deeper understanding of what happened. Because uh, uh, I must admit, when I wrote the book Looting of America, I was kind of naive. Uh, I didn't realize what they were really up to. So this book is uh, taking us into uh, new territory. OK, let me start by asking you a question. Uh, what's a fair hourly wage for you. What are you hoping to earn when you become journeyman? What's a good hourly wage? A million dollars an hour. <laughs> oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that that's my fee for tonight. So <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Dean Merrill. Uh, what's, a, what's a good wage for, uh, yeah? $56 an hour. $56 an hour. What do you think? 60. 60? You'd like to get 60? OK. Let's say it's, let's, let's go for. 56 to 60 bucks an hour. Why is someone going to pay you $60 an hour? Why? Yes? Because of the skills that I have to do the okay. job. OK, because of the skills you have to do the job. It's not just the skills you have, right? It's actually applying the skills you have to do the job. So why are they going to give you money? What's in it for them? What? OK, there's risk involved. What else? For the services we provide for them to make profit. Right, the ser you're providing services to them to make profit, yeah? Right, you work hard to develop your skills, to uh, be go through this whole apprenticeship program, including a couple years of college at the minimum. What else, yeah? Right, you're producing a building. You're, you're, they, they can, you know, you're commercial electricians putting up a building. Yeah. You're making money for them as well. You're making money for them as well. Yes. The product that they're going to receive after we finish building is going to be worth ten times as much as the sixty dollars an hour. Right. You're 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 producing a high quality product that has incredible value to the people that are hiring you. Fair enough. Okay. So the mystery we're going to try to figure out. Uh, ten, uh, this afternoon, is what do the, these things called hedge funds produce? But before we get there, let's look at uh, uh, some of the occupations in this country uh, that uh, have the highest incomes and see what it looks like on an hourly basis. Let's start with, here are the 10, by the way, the first chapter of this book, we put together, uh, we, uh, we look at, at the uh, wealthiest occupations in the country. So here are the top 10 uh, movie stars from 2010. 
takes a while to put a book into production, so those are the latest numbers that we had. You can see uh, Leonard DiCaprio leads the list. Uh, his uh, income was $77 million. You divide it by 2080, right? Number of hours you guys work in a year, and you get to his hourly income was $37,019. Uh, the, the average for that group was $21,298 an hour, the average for the top 10. As you can see, includes you know Seinfeld and Depp and uh, Adam Sandler, and the bottom of the list is Angelina Jolie. Right? They make a good living. So how? Do, what do they do to uh, make all that money? How come they get paid so much? Because they have a certain skill that um, provides a profit for the people hiring them. Right, for sure, absolutely, a skill provides a profit for the people hiring them. Yes. They have a lot of bargaining power. There's only one Leo DiCaprio. There's only one Andrew. DiCaprio. There's that. They have a lot of bargaining power. Anything else? Yes. They sell movie tickets. There you go. They sell movie tickets. So you got, and what's behind the movie tickets? There's a really simple exchange here. We like watching them, so we'll pay to watch them, right? And in exchange, they get money, we get entertainment. We get pleasure watching them. So it's something we all understand. Do we begrudge them making a, bit, a lot of money? Well, uh, you know, they, it's kind of fun to watch them, right? We all keep going. We don't go on strike and stay out of the movie theaters. We like, we, we're not protesting over the $10 tickets. We seem to go. OK, so let's take a look at this now, at the top occupations in the country. Uh, uh, let's start at the bottom. Uh, this was from 2010. You can see the uh, uh, bank, uh, top bank insurance CEOs, they were like, roughly $8,000 an hour, and we go up to lawyers, authors. By the way, I did not make the top 10 in 2010. I'm working on it for 2013. When Mike gives me the check, I'll get very close. Uh, you got the movie stars. You got your top athletes. By the way, that would be Tiger Woods was number one then. Uh, top CEOs, musicians, top celebrities in general, like Oprah was number one on that list. I was very surprised to find out that the top of this whole group were movie directors. They make more than movie stars. Well, I guess they put the whole thing together. It makes sense. So what we did is we put it, you could see their hourly income. And then there's this thing called hedge fund managers that are like off the charts, $842,788 an hour. That's a lot of money. That's 40 times what the movie stars make, 40 times. What do they do? Tell me. We don't know what they do, do we? We don't know. You go ask anybody what they do, and you're going to get uh, a stare. I don't know. Are we paying to watch them perform, hit a golf ball? We don't know what they do. But they're making way off the list, right? So let's take a look at a little closer. What is a hedge fund? Uh, this is a college, right? So you've got to get a multiple choice test. Here, here are your options. A, a wholesale garden supply business that specializes in growing and trimming hedges. B, a mutual fund where anyone can invest that hedges against tough times. C, an investment fund for the super rich and large institutions, by the way, where you need, to, where you need at least a million dollars in wealth in order to invest. A, B, or C? C. All right, it is C. Uh, I didn't make the test hard enough. Uh, I'll talk to your teachers about that afterwards. Uh, OK, so that's what it is. And uh, it's actually for more than just wealthy investors. You've got pension funds that want to get in on the action. Uh, lots of the large banks want to invest in these funds. And these funds are kind of very interesting. The person who runs them gets 2% of the money off the top and then 20% of the profits. So the question then becomes is, what do they invest in? How do they play their game? Well, the top hedge fund guy in 2010 made $2.4 million an hour in 2010. That's as much as the average family makes in 47 years. Think about that. One hour of work. Did you go to work today? One hour would equal a family's income, average family, for a lifetime, 47 years. So if you're going to do that in our economic system, you better be producing a whole lot of value for the economy. All those things you just mentioned before about you know, building something that will last for a long time and it's worth 10 times more when you're done because of all the great work you did 
and the skill you put into it and the, and the, and the uh, service it provides, all that stuff you talked about, it better be true here or we got a big problem. So let's explore that question. Oh, there's another one. The top 25 hedge funds that year, by the way, earned as much as 658,000 teachers who teach 13 million kids. Just giving you a sense of how big these guys were. Okay, let me, let me put another dimension of this puzzle. I, I want you to get very curious about what these people do. Let me make you even more curious. In 2010, the top hedge fund made as much money as Apple. Apple has approximately 700,000 employees and contractors all over the world. The top hedge fund had under 100 employees. So with under 100 employees, they, produce, they supposedly produced as much economic value as Apple with 700,000 employees. What did they do? What did they do for all that money? We ought to be feeling their impact, right? We ought to, they ought to be doing something great absolutely stupendous for the American economy. So where does all that money come from? How is it possible for that much money to exist? I mean, you're hoping to get your $50, $60 an hour, and you're well on your way to doing that, and you'll be worth every penny. Where does all their money come from? Any questions so far? Are you with me? Yeah? Still awake? OK, good. Most of you, anyway. All right. I want you, th th there's only one chart in this whole talk that you've got to grasp and hang on to. And if you do, this chart will do you well for the rest of your life. What we're looking at here, that top purple line is a measure of US productivity. Have you heard the word productivity at work? Are people talking about productivity? You know, how much output you put out? They want you to get a certain number of jobs done. Well, if you measure that for the whole economy, what it comes down to is it measures the level of organization, technique, technology, skill that exists in the whole economy. And what's amazing about the American economy is that every year in the last 65 years, every year except five years, productivity went up. In other words, the amount, uh, the way they measure it is they take the total amount of what we produce and divide it by the number of hours it takes to produce it. Not how much it costs, but the number of hours. So we were able to produce more and more per hour every year. And even the years that it didn't go up, it, it, it didn't go down by very much. That steady line measures the wealth of the United States. Up, up, up. That's why we've got so much stuff. Because, and, and you've, you've probably already seen it in your short careers, that new techniques come in, new, right? You get to use a different kind of a switching box or something. You get to do the job faster, a little bit better, more efficiently. It, not only faster, but sometimes actually even better, right? So that's part of productivity. Well, between World War II, the end of World War II, and through the mid-1970s, every time productivity went up, the average worker's wage also went up. In real terms, after inflation. And uh, I don't think too many people here are my age, but if you grew up when I grew up, in the 50s uh, and 60s, you would have noticed my parents were working class immigrant people. And uh, their standard of living, we lived, uh, you know, little box house uh, out in the burbs, and you could see that their standard of living was going up every year, a little bit. You know, they got a few more, you know, air conditioners for the house, and then they went, they even went on a vacation, you know, to some place. They went on like a cruise for the, for the first time in their lives, like in the 60s. They were able to send me to a private university. They couldn't, my older sister, because they didn't have the money then. That was going on throughout the economy, and the real wage went from about $400 a week, after you take care of inflation in today's dollars, went up to $746 a week. So that's average uh, for working people across the economy. Then you notice something weird happen. The two lines split apart. Wages start going down, productivity keeps going up. And that's something quite amazing happened when those two lines split apart. Any idea? Any ideas come to mind? Yeah? I would say internet and products. Internet comes later. Actually comes later. Comes in the 80s. But uh, there was some technology involved. But it's funny. These two lines in Europe don't split apart like this. And they have the same technology. Here, something special happened. Any ideas? 
Yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah, some. Uh, actually, it started under a Democrat. Uh, any other ideas? Yes. Well, stock market been around a long time, so uh, it, uh, the decline in unionism. That was one piece. Decline in unionism. Yeah. I was going to say, um, uh, the stock market crash. There were some stock market crashes in there. There were, and there was some turbulence going on in the economy. Yes. The strike management firms. Uh, yeah, there was definitely some of that. Definitely that. Yeah. Greed. Greed. <laughs> now it's very interesting that you should say that. <laughs> I actually tried to do some research on the history of greed. And uh, I think it's been with us for a long time. <laughs> so the question, be, but, but you raise an important question, because uh, what societies can do is contain it or let it go. Right? It, it, it's something that can move. Deregulation. Deregulation. There's, there, and, uh, 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 let, let, me, let me talk about deregulation, You're talking about, by the way, from a business point of view, what's the number one regulation that business uh, wants to get rid of? Take a guess. Number one. Minimum wage. Minimum wage? Well, yeah, if you're a low-income business, true. But in general, when business says we have to get rid of regulation, what do you think they're thinking about the most? Taxes. Taxes? Yeah. Unions! See, this ought, you're smart. You're the first audience that's guessed that. It wasn't a guess. It wasn't a guess. It was knowledge. <laughs> Who's your professor? <laughs> All right, very well done. Well done. Uh, uh, the, you, unions are the biggest regulation that a, a business faces, right? Because you're right there. You know, government regulation, they can kind of get around, but the union's right there. So one of the pieces they, they want to deregulate, the, what happened was the economy was getting kind of screwed up during that period. And... Uh, can we get our two lines up again? There we go. There. There was, the, there was a, a very turbulent period of the economy. And, and, and a, a bunch of economists and policymakers got together and they said, you know what, we need a new, a new theory of how to uh, run this economy. And here's what we should do. We should uh, deregulate, which is unions, but also we should deregulate finance. Especially finance. Finance, if you deregulate them, they're going to do some good things. So let's, let's make it tough for unions, deregulate finance, get rid of uh, uh, taxes, uh, especially on the, on, the, on, the, on the rich people. Because what's going to happen is you put all that together, and they're going to invest it, and you're going to get a boom, and all boats are going to rise. That was the theory. And so they put that into practice there. And they wanted to, the gentleman that mentioned, the brother mentioned greed. Yeah, they wanted to put greed to work for the American economy. We're going to make greed work for us. And we, we did, as you can see, productivity really uh, uh, took off. But the wages didn't. And the gap between those two lines had to go somewhere. So where did it go? The only chart I could find anywhere that looks like this one is this one. Note. Kind of the same. They split apart. They're together. You know what this is? This is the wages in the financial sector versus everything else. Wall Street wages versus wages in industry, your wages, average. The two were together, like in the other picture. Then they, once deregulation takes place, a few years later, this is 1980, the wages on Wall Street shoot up like a rocket. Boom. Right? And that, so that's like in the mid-70s, and now the line split apart in 1980s. The money goes up to Wall Street. This answers the question of how do these hedge funds have so much money to even play with? Because this theory of deregulation and tax cuts came in, and once you deregulate Wall Street, you can expect incredible things to happen, and they did. Okay. So that's our little investment boom. This is the plan that split the lines. Any questions on this? Yes? Just one point on that, the first graph on uh, productivity. Productivity actually, it, it didn't slow down, but it didn't really boom either. What really happened, looks like, was just the division 
right? It, well, you actually... They, they, they look like they're doing so much better, but it's really it's right. skimming all the time. Well, let, let me... I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me make uh, two points that I, I, I neglected to make. The first is the difference between those two lines this year is something like $3 trillion. The average wage would have been $1,171 a week. The average, you guys be looking at 100 an hour. The average would be 1171 if the World War II trend continued, where productivity would be shared uh, on a very consistent basis with working people. So yes, it doesn't, it doesn't like go vertical. That's what goes vertical <laughs> on Wall Street. OK, let's move on here. Here's the decline in unions. What they wanted to see happen, happen. They wanted to get rid of that re deregulation, and down it goes. Here's what happened in the banking industry. Uh, the, these are the top six banks as a percent of the whole economy. Jumps from 14.8% to 62%. So Wall Street got more concentrated and bigger. Is that also because of mergers? Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, once you deregulate, you can do whatever you want. They, they used to not be able to have uh, all these banks merge. You couldn't have a bank that operated in more than one state. <laughs> now, now you've got Citibank and uh, Chase and uh, Bank America all over the country. And there's only a few of them left. Okay. The other thing that happened, of course, was the richest people got a lot richer. In 1973, before the two lines split apart, 8% of the total income of the country went to the top 1%. Believe me, there were still rich people when I was growing up, and they weren't us. I mean, there were plenty of rich people around. Now it's gotten kind of crazy. 23% of all the income goes to the top 1%, almost three times as much thanks to that uh, deregulation plan. OK, this is one I thought you'd like. This is original data here. We took the top 100 CEOs in the country and uh, uh, compared it to the average wage of a worker. In 1970, for every $1 a worker earned, the CEO, the top 100 CEOs earned $45. As those lines split apart, now the top CEO guy by 2006 was earning $1,723. Now, do you think that they got that much smarter that quickly? Right? Because did their skill get so much greater during that period? That's a question to consider. But it sure matches our line splitting apart. For every, dollar? For every dollar that you earn, they earn they went from $45 to 1723 in 20 in uh, uh, 36 years. That's quite a change. Okay. So how do hedge funds, how do these not garden supply places, how do these investment funds actually make money? I'm going to give you one technique and if you master this technique, you can go get a job on Wall Street. I'm telling you, this is, this is the craziest thing I ever came across. Are you ready for this? Yeah? No? Yeah. Or you want me to just, I, I, I could go on to a different secret. I don't have to tell you this one. All right, you want this one. Okay, let's go. Let's go do it. The trick is you've got to create something that's designed to fail, and then you can collect the insurance on it. So it's the equivalent of you going to work, right? wiring it so it's going to burn down within six months, and then you take an insurance policy out, out on the building so you can collect. How long do you think you'd last if you did that? Not too long. But that's what we're going to get into. Ever hear these words? These are called financial innovations that hedge funds were a big part of, mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, CDO squared, credit default swaps, synthetic CDOs. These are the terms that they use. And they're, they're, believe me, when I first saw these, I, I, my eyes glazed over. I said, oh, my God. I, I, I bought a textbook on one of them. It cost me $90. I, I read two pages, and it was all math, and I had to, I had to put the book down. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. I, I couldn't get past two pages. Worst $90 I'd ever spent. OK, here's what we're going to be talking about. That's the housing boom. If you look at that line, start with the, the graph I have only uh, starts in 1987. But if we went back all the way to here, back to like 1850, the line would more or less be flat. And this is uh, taking a care of inflation and everything else. This is the cost of housing back through time. It more or less is constant. And then something incredible happened 
uh, a decade ago, and it shot through the roof and then crashed. So this is the economic crash. Housing prices hit uh, levels, as you probably experienced or heard, like never before, and then boom, it goes down. And I'm going to give you a hint tonight about how that happened. At least I'm going to try. Did someone bring the champagne? <laughs> OK. Uh, here are the basics. And you got to stop me if this doesn't make any sense to you. Here's what they did. You ever hear, what, you know what a subprime mortgage is? You know what these garbage mortgages are? You know, where they, they give you, uh, you're not qualified, but they give you the mortgage anyway. And then uh, uh, the interest rate starts off really low, and then it jumps up. And they say, don't worry, you can sell your house in a couple of years. And what? Balloon, that's one of the uh, versions. But they basically are looking for people who don't really qualify for a regular 30-year conventional mortgage, and they do these uh, uh, subprime mortgages. So here is their trick. You gather up 1,000 subprime mortgages, right? And they, they're, all, they're, they're supposed to pay interest and principal every month. You take the interest. You pour it into a bottle. One place. That bottle is all the interest. Now, all of these mortgages are not going to fail at the same time. The, matter of fact, historically, 90% of people in high-risk mortgages paid, 10% with default. So what you do is you, you put all the interest rates together, all the interest money, all that income, and you, these wine glasses, those are securities like bonds. And you set up a system where you pour out the wine, the champagne to the top rows first, then the middle row, then the bottom row. And you say, the top row bonds get paid first. So no matter what happens, if you have 20% foreclosures or 30%, you're going to pay the top people first. So if you buy that bond, you're going to be OK, right? You're going to be fine. You're going to get your interest rate. You're going to get a very good deal. You with me so far? So they took that to the rating agencies. They got AAA ratings, which meant they were as good as buying a government bond. No problem. Well, the middle, and they gave them a nice interest rate, too, because it was junk, bond, junk mortgages underneath. So they're paying a high interest rate. People said, oh, that's good. You know, eventually, they'll pay a high interest rate. So you're going to get a nice interest rate return. They sold those things like hotcakes. That top row, they sold them all over the world. The next row, uh, those were a little riskier, right? Because you only get paid after the top guys get paid. So the, the next row was a little harder to sell. And the bottom row, that's the gamblers. Uh, they call them tranches. You buy the bottom security, you get 20 30% return. But you're the first to get wiped out if, uh, if, if the mortgages start to default. So that's called the mortgage-backed security. So what do you think they, so, and they had no problem selling the top row. And of course, once they start selling, more people buying houses, and they're getting cheap mortgages, and then they're selling them to Wall Street, who are packaging them up like this and selling them. It's like a conveyor belt. It's like an assembly line of mortgages. You with me? What do you do? You guys are smart, and gals. What do you do if you can't sell the ones in the middle row? What do you do with them? Without the first row. What? You go to the bottom row. Well, no, the, the, let's say you can't send the, sell the middle one. Discount them? Discount them? That's possible. What else? What, what else could you do with them? What? How do you do that? This guy, this, he's, he's auditioning for a Wall Street job. How do you do that? You package them into the other row. There you go. Here we go. Got to keep your eye on these two. Uh, uh, what they, when they couldn't sell the middle row, they would take all the middle rows and package them together, create a new wine bottle, and start the process all over again. So now the wine bottle is filled with the stuff that goes into the middle rows. And guess what? So they started the whole thing over again. That's called a collateralized debt obligation. Now you've got 10,000 underlying junk mortgages put together. And guess what? When they, they poured, poured the wine out again, starting at the top, working it down, when they got uh, done with it, they went to a rating agency, guess what happened? Triple A rating once again for the top. So now, 
just think about the miracle that was created. This is like the fish in the loaves, right? You took the middle row that, was, that you couldn't sell, you packaged it all together, and you got yourself another AAA set of mortgages to sell, uh, uh, securities to sell, which they then did all over the world. Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> now what do you do with the middle row? What do you do with the middle row? You're still having trouble selling the middle row, just like the last time, only now it's even more dangerous. What do you do? Same thing. They did it one more time. That's called the CDO squared. Okay, now, this is where it gets, and guess what? They got AAA ratings for the top row again. So now you've sold... The mortgage-backed securities, which had a chance of succeeding, you, the junk that you couldn't sell from that, you packaged and got, and got by the way, it's about 70% of them that get the AAA ratings. So you got 70% three times. Pretty good. Pretty good. Now, here's where the hedge funds come in. So by now, you, the stock market is, I mean, the housing prices are going straight up, right? This is, this is. Who's selling these? Big banks. Okay. Big banks. This is being done by your Goldman Sachs and your Citigroup and your J.P. Morgan Chase and your Deutsche Bank, and they're they're the ones that are uh, are doing this. They have the they have the customers they can off it on, and they have the ability to warehouse all the and get all all the legal stuff and get it together. But guess what? That became too difficult, too hard. They were running out of subprime mortgages. There weren't enough dead people to give mortgages to, which is what they were doing, by the way, in Las Vegas. And a guy who did it uh, for this country, uh, country uh, I can't remember if it was countrywide or not, actually a guy who was engaging in fraud who was an employee of one of these mortgage companies actually got rewarded as like the employee of the year for all his sales, even after he was caught. After he was caught, he was rewarded. So uh, this was big business. Here's where it gets wild. They were running out of mortgages, so they decided to do this synthetically. They could create the same things through a series of bets called credit default swaps. I can't explain to you right now exactly how they did it. But Matt, do you guys know uh, fantasy sports? Do you know how fantasy sports works? You don't own the players, right? But you can still bet on them. You have teams based on football players you select and you can have, right? It, you don't own the players? Well, they figured out how to do that as well. They did this whole thing again as if they owned them, but they didn't own them. They pl literally, they set the same thing up as a series of bets. Fantasy mortgage. Fantasy mortgage, fantasy finance, exactly. They played the same game. They looked at, they said, pretend you own these mortgages in Las Vegas and these mortgages in New York and these mortgages in Florida. And let's see what happens to them and we'll set the same thing up. I, again, it's too complicated to explain, but believe, trust me, they did it. And here's where the here's where the hedge funds came in. Yeah. Creating insurance without insurance. Well, they created insurance in a, in in the oddest way. Here's what they did uh, to make that bet to make those bet work bets work. Uh, the people that bought, let's say, the top row, they they get the insurance premiums from someone who is betting that those things may, won't work out forever. So they, there's literally like an insurance company that uh, uh, they become the insurance company and the person paying the insurance uh, is the hedge fund. And so it's like a bet. I'm betting that uh, uh, my team is going to win and you're betting that my team is going to lose. It's, it's, it's really that simple. But here's where it's not so simple. The hedge funds, unbeknownst to the people that were buying these securities, the hedge funds went out and found the worst mortgages they could find. Let's put in this area of Las Vegas where they're having huge number of defaults. Let's put in this part of Arizona where we know that the brokers were actually engaged in fraud. Let's go into Florida where we see that the whole neighborhood is already, you know, uh, is unoccupied and uh, they're never going to pay off their uh, mortgages. So what they did is, th there's this great case called Abacus, this is all in government documents, where literally the hedge fund and, and Goldman Sachs colluded to create something like this, sold off the top row to, uh, for a billion dollars to three large institutions, 
a billion dollars, and the hedge fund guy bet against it. So if, the, if, if, if uh, those houses went into default, the hedge fund guy was going to win a billion dollars. What the people buying didn't know was that the hedge fund picked the mortgages. And what kind of mortgages do you pick? The worst ones. You design it to fail so you can collect the insurance. I swear to God this happened. The hedge fund got a billion dollars. Goldman Sachs made its money by servicing uh, the hedge fund and selling it. And the investors lost a billion dollars. Now, of course, this happened right at the peak of the housing uh, market because people were trying to unload the junk that they had, these securities that they had. So, this was, so every big bank started to play this game with hedge funds. Design something that's going to fail and then take out the insurance on it. Does that sound crazy? They got a kickback scheme for the banks. Oh, they got, there were all kinds of kickback schemes. So they enabled the... the oh, they, they saw... They, and, and now, the question is, uh, uh, when they did these kickback schemes, do you think it was legal? What was legal about this and what do you think was uh, illegal? about this trend. By the way, can you think of anywhere else in our economy, any place else where you're allowed to produce something uh, that's going to fail so you can bet against it? Can you think of it? I mean, if you've tried to fix a horse race, all right, bookies are not allowed to fix a horse race. Or a hit and run accident where you try to collect the, you know, you set up a hit and yeah. run. And you right. I, and that's called illegal, <laughs> Sandy. That's <laughs> illegal. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I'm trying to say, is there any place where it's legal? I, I mean, can you can you guys go and wire something up so a house so, so it's going to burn up? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you probably could figure out how to do it, but I don't think I think you you'd go away. They put you away, right? So, so it's it's probably not legal. Uh, but a lot of these trading firms are also affiliated with banks as well. You said like J.P. Morgan and Chase. So you have the Chase applying the mortgages, knowing which ones are going to fail. You have J.P. Morgan side, which is doing like trading. Ah, that, you know, they didn't get caught doing quite that. But they, uh, uh, that, that would be interesting if, if, J, if J.P. Morgan already told the hedge fund, these are our worst mortgages, why don't you put them in this fund so it will fail even faster. Uh, that didn't quite happen. But what did happen is the government came in and investigated, and they fined Goldman Sachs $550 million, and J.P. Morgan $154 million, and Citigroup $570 million for playing this game. That's all. That's all. Guess how much the hedge funds were fined? Zero. Zero. They got to keep all their money. By the way, I, I wrote a piece in Huffington Post where I suggested that uh, uh, perhaps uh, this was a, a bit of a slimy thing. And if these hedge fund people were so smart, why did they have to engage in what I considered a near criminal conspiracy? Guess what happened? It's a dog they, fired you? they threatened to sue me. Oh, okay. The hedge funds threatened to sue me for, for uh, being involved in a near, a near criminal conspiracy. They dropped the word near. Now, I, I got this. I, actually, it shook me. I got scared. I said, you know, a billion, this was the richest of the hedge fund guys, right? The number one, the $2.4 million an hour guys coming after me. So I'm thinking, wait, I didn't say he was a criminal. I said it was a near criminal conspiracy. And I'm thinking, what? it's like nearly having sex. I mean, isn't there a difference between the two? I think so, if I remember correctly. There's a big difference. Yeah? If it isn't, let me know. Uh, so I, uh, I chickened out. I withdrew the piece after a week. It already had gotten like, you know, 300,000 hits. So I, you know, I, got my, I got the word out. But I got scared. Then I found out he was uh, some uh, phony publisher was calling my agent to get a look at the, a draft of the next book, this book. And then they wouldn't give their name. So I'm realizing, OK, now they're investigating. There's a, there's a private investigator on my tail. Because these guys are touchy. Why are they so touchy? Why do you think they're so touchy? They know they're on the ethical edge. They know they skated right off to the ethical edge and beyond. But uh, this is just the start of it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. All those banks that were fined, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, um, what were they actually fined for? What were they? Was there ah, some criminal? Excellent found? question. Yes, no, excellent question. They were fined for not fully disclosing to their investors that the hedge fund was handicapping the race. That's what they were fined for. They didn't fully disclose that the hedge fund guy was picking the horses in the race. 
design, you know, picking the picking them to lose. Uh, that that's so uh, uh, full disclosure laws. But this is the only place in capitalism, the only place I can think of where you're allowed to do this. You want to hear? Yeah, go ahead. Walmart takes out life insurance policies on its employees. So well, when they you die, can they, they make they, money. They can take. Uh, they do that on their executives. On, on everybody, they do that. I, I, I know they've done everything. They usually do it on executives. For example, the college probably has one on Dean Merrill <laughs> <laughs> because he'd be absolutely impossible to replace. So, uh, the hardship involved is uh, is there. Uh, let me just move on here for a second. I want to ask you. Uh, I, I've got. That's just one story of what they do. Uh, you, you up for another one? Uh, do you, yeah? You know Jim Cramer on Mad Money? You ever see this guy on TV? Yeah. yeah. He's a riot, right? He's like a, talks faster than me. Uh, and he, he used to run a hedge fund. And uh, he ran it for 10 years, and his, his rate of return, his percentage return average was 23%. A year, every year. So he writes this book called Confessions of a Street Junkie, a Street Addict or something, and he describes how he does it, and it's, it's, it's actually an entertaining book, uh, uh, and it's you know, full of his woes and everything else. But it's not a confession. He then does an interview 10 years later on a website that he partially owns, and he says what he does. And I read this thing, and I went, oh my god, this guy is saying this stuff? Here's what he says. You know, he works for CNBC, right? And he used to be, even when he ran his hedge fund, he used to appear on CNBC. So what he would do, what would you do if you were trying to uh, manipulate the market and you're on CNBC? Have any ideas? Let's see, let me see how devious you really can, can are. Yeah? Lie about what the stock market is. There you go, lie about the stock market. But here's how he lies about it. He knows if he says it, he wouldn't have it. Yeah, so he, he slips it to other reporters. He says, I got a tip that, you know, uh, 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 Google's got a problem with an application. And he, he, he actually he did it about Apple, because Apple never would ever tell a reporter what it was doing. So if you slip false information to a journalist, there's no way for them to check it. So he would slip them little things. His own colleagues on CNBC, they would report it, and then the stock he was betting on it would either go up or down based on that report. And he basically says, in order to run a hedge fund, you have to lie. He says that in this interview. But here's what he really says. He says, if you're not willing to do these things, you shouldn't be in the game. Whoa. That's pretty amazing. All right. You heard about insider trading? We now have 70 people behind bars because what they do is they get a tip on a stock before everybody else does and they can make their bet. It's, the, by the way, when people talk about uh, Wall Street as being a casino, wrong word. Casino, there's a game of chance, it's regulated, there's odds, everybody knows them, and you can win or lose. When you're making big money like this, you don't want to take a risk. So you want that insider information. So there's no chance of you losing. It list goes on and on. You'll have to read the book. The book is, we're going to stop for questions shortly. The book is designed for uh, uh, those of you who want to make a million dollars an hour. It's a 12 step guide. We wa walk you through 12 steps uh, from rags to riches. And if you have any problems with this, it'll also explain some of the ethical problems that are involved here. Anyway, uh, uh, but this stuff isn't just fun and games. Let me ask you this, let me, let me close with a question. Should we prevent this kind of money making? If not, why not? Should, this, should we let these hedge funds do what they do? Like build products designed to fail. It's a free country? Yes, no. What do you think? No. Yeah. No, because they, they manipulate the stock market. They can cause companies to either do well or crash it's people's jobs and people's lives, and um, it's wrong. Well, that's and interesting. For their personal gain. Well, here's what they say. He says, don't worry about it. It doesn't cause you any problems. I'm just taking money for some other rich person. Yeah, no. but that rich person is Who's paying for that money? Yeah, good it's question. just another rich person. It's the Wisconsin School District, for example, where everybody's a bright person who goes and buys this kind of thing without anything behind it. 
Very, excellent point. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> excellent point. What, are you going to get in the way of these rich people trying to you know, earn as much as they can? Don't you want to earn as much as you can? You want somebody telling you not to do it? Yeah, what about that? What about that? There has to be some kind of principles or ethics. Right? But the question would be is the moral standpoint of it. At what cost? All right, let me talk about at what cost now that you bring that up. You know, when, that, when we saw the picture of the stock market, uh, the housing market hitting the top and then coming down, that coming down was accelerated. Dramatically, on the way up, it was accelerated by that crazy fantasy finance baseball game they were playing. On the way down, it got accelerated. Because imagine this. If there's one underlying mortgage and 20 different bonds are betting on one underlying mortgage, if it goes down, the 20 bonds go down. So when they said they had junk, you know, toxic assets and all that stuff all over the world, they really did. It all came crashing down. And this game of betting, designing things to fail, that accelerated the downward push. And you got this. Number of unemployed people, look at fairly steady from 2000 to 2008. Boom! When the game ended, jumped up to 14.3 million people were unemployed. It will take over 12 years at the current rate. Even I, was, I make this estimate based on this last month when the unemployment rate went down and there were jobs created. At that rate, it'll take 12 years for us to get back to where we were before the crash. 12 years from today. And hopefully, you know, hopefully you guys will get jobs and hang out to jobs. Yeah. I think everyone who lost their job during the financial crisis needs to go hang out at John Paulson's house and have him put them up. Okay, no names mentioned. I don't want to get sued again. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you can tell them to write to Kate Spaulding. They can sue me. Okay, great. I have uh, money. I'm actually so, worth negative for my student loans. <laughs> so, so what do we? So, so what do we do? Uh, what can we do? If you wanted to bring some morality into this situation, some ethics, what do you do? What can we do? Liz, can I first ask? Sure. What would they say? What would hedge fund managers, defenders of Wall Street, what would Bloomberg say? What's the value that they are bringing to the economy? Chapter two. <laughs> Step two. Oh, we have to read the book? We have to read the book. Now, uh, they, there, there's a whole cottage industry of people that I call hedge fund cheerleaders. Uh, who claim that what they do is as valuable as all of Silicon Valley. But the things that they say is they're the, literally their defense of hedge funds was that, it, that they, they take on risk that nobody else wants and they stabilize the economic system. How'd that work for us in 2008? In other words, they, all the stuff about hedge fund cheerleading was written in 2007 and 2006. And they claim, they, they, have, they have a whole bunch of claims. That's just one of them. They stabilize the system. They keep crashes from happening. They make the whole system more flexible. They make sure there's money there. When you want to buy and sell stocks, you, you can always do it. Uh, there's a, they have a whole series of things. I go through each one of them in, in, one of, in chapter two or three, whatever it is. I go through each single one of them. And I think you'll find that their claims are based on wishful thinking. Really, the only thing they care about the only thing they care about is squeezing out some profit. Anybody here have an E-Trade account? Anybody invest any money anywhere? OK. Here, the, by the time, you know, when you press the button to buy something, before that trade goes through, there are a group of hedge funds called high-frequency traders who buy the stock faster than you do and sell it back to you for a few pennies more and wow. pocket the difference every single time. Uh -huh. Done electronically with these high frequency computers that are located right next to the Wall Street Exchange. They make from five to twenty billion dollars a year doing that. Now I've got now tell me what good that does you. That, that's the question. And I try to explore all those questions in the book. They have, believe me, there are hundreds of arguments that they, they make in, in, in their behalf. But when you push on them, you realize that they're in business for one reason only, right? They're gonna make as much money as they can, any way they can. If, and, expect, and try not to get caught. Yes? If, if you, if we have to have rules. Like if you make, if you want to make profit from the American economy, you have to, you have to give a pledge of, of some kind of economical responsibility where you have to reinvest in the, in the country, in the industry. That's a good point. I, the reason I'm smiling, it's an excellent point. The reason I'm smiling is that there was this uh, 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 
uh, in the Harvard Business Review, this uh, uh, business psychologist, this woman from UCLA, writes an article about why she thinks hedge funds do, do what they do. And she comes up with this word, uh, she calls it crimogenic. Mm -hmm. That basically, the atmosphere of working in a hedge fund encourages you to break the law uh, every, every which way you can. Uh, so there'd have to be a sea change for the morality you're talking about to take place. So the question is, how do we get there? My question is, why is it possible for them to do this when you have companies or, or industries like pharmaceutical industries who sell drugs for inflated prices and when the government finds out with all the side effects and all the, you know, the uh, FCC and all these other instruments come into play, they get regulated, they get bumped down, they get sideswiped and generic, you know, brands come out and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But these guys, they can't make generic brands of money and financial institutions. It's like you either roll with them or you shut it all down. Well, it, that, when, when we took our, uh, let me give you just a little bit of history and you can understand how we got here again. In 1929, there was a stock market crash and we found out at that time that Wall Street firms were manipulating the stock market, you know, inflating stock prices, doing all kinds of stuff. So we regulated the hell out of them starting in the 1930s. We put our foot on Wall Street, saw those two lines of their wages and everybody else's were the same. We, we made Wall Street a boring place to work. But then when we took our foot off in the mid-1970s, 1980s, the game, the, this whole game started again. And basically, the genie is out of the bottle. So the question becomes, how do you put it back in? How do you re-regulate it? They're very strong now. One of these guys is given $100 million to Central Park. Another is given $100 million to uh, the public library here in New York. How do, you, how, do you, how do you get the genie back in the bottle? Yeah. Uh, what did you start with creating awareness? You know, the awareness, I think, what you explained to us today is, is minute compared to you know, what it should be. And then the American public would start fighting back. And it you know, started to happen for a while. We had Occupy Wall Street. There was a point where we were starting to like say, whoa, you know what? Maybe they should pay us back for the damage they did. Let me give you one, uh, since we're, we're getting now uh, near to the end of uh, Mike does not want to pay me overtime. It's a million and a half. Uh, oh wait, it's after it's after six o'clock. I'm sorry, it's double time. Two million. Okay. Uh, there's a thing called a financial transaction tax or a financial speculation tax, and it's a it's uh, uh, it's the, there's ten countries in Europe that are doing this now, which is they put a little tax on every single stock, bond, funny money, in instruments, all these fancy finance things. They put a little tax on every time they're bought and sold. And what, uh, uh, if the tax were big enough, I, I made one calculation. Catch this. It could provide, enough money could be generated to provide free tuition for every student in the country going to a public college or university. No more debt. So this is a big deal. And they're scared to do it. It wipes out high frequency trading because they're going to make a few pennies out of all of your uh, They're collecting a hidden tax. This makes the tax overt. Uh, so there's a, there's a very, uh, that's a big one. You could, we could prohibit high frequency trading. There's a loophole, by the way. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. Oh. Not only do they make all that money, the, billion, the billionaire, the million dollars an hour, but they pay less tax than you do because they have a special loophole called carried interest where they can only, they, it was 15%, now it's 20% instead of the top rate. So they have a tax loophole that they're hanging on for dear life. And we're talking about uh, sequestering and austerity and that tax loophole still makes it through. Uh, and there, there's a good case to be made that we should limit the size of these hedge funds so they can't, can't be so big. Just say it can't be bigger than a certain, a certain amount. But the, the bottom line comes out to this, that none of this happens. Nothing happens. No morality, as you said, is going to be brought in unless we do something about it. And you all are actually, one day, may end up being leaders in your union and in your community. And it, it's going to be up to, up to you. I, I'm getting a little long in the tooth here. 
Uh, I don't know that I'm going to be around to see it, but the, the game won't change until you force it to change. And it starts with awareness, as you said, but then it's going to start, then we're going to have to make some demands and force it, I believe, on both political parties. So, so, so. so we're, we're all union members, and from everything we're hearing, it seems like this activity is against our best interest. So what do you think? How should we, uh, how much force should we use to, to change the situation and, and um, improve our economy and improve the way money is distributed in, in, in the United States? What do people think? How do you bet against them? <laughs> they bet against us, how do you bet against them? Oh, it's a... How do you think, how, respond to that, how do we bet against them? How do we change the, you know, the, 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 the odds, put them more in our favor? Yes. Can we start a petition to the, uh, the branch of government that's in charge? Sounds like a good idea, what else? Design a system that can make them feel every time. Sorry? Design a system that can make them feel and collect on them. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yes. Invest more wisely. Invest more Probably wisely. What these schools are trying to really convince you to do. I would, I would like to hear some, see some other faces here if you're jumping in. What else goes into a hedge fund other than stocks? They, they can do whatever they want to do. They can buy companies, they can buy bonds, they can buy bets upon bets. You see when we hit the click button on the uh, E-Trade, they already make two cents or something on that before we even get that thing through. But if you buy a piece of real estate, how do you think, or I'm just thinking, uh, they, what else goes into it that they benefit from? How do you uh, focus more on something else rather than stock? Yeah, uh, I'm not, let me, let me just make, this one point. I don't think there's any way we can outplay them at their own game. Uh, I think it becomes uh, a quite, it, it's political. It, the, it's the rules of the game that allow them to get going. In other words, when you regulate, they can't play this game. When you deregulate, they can play this game. So it's a question of how, uh, of whether you want more regulations and how to get them. Yes? So in order to regulate, just like anything else that you want to get done, you have to unite and you have to send letters to your Congress people, you have to send letters to your representatives, you have to let them know that this is not something you'll tolerate, and you're looking for regulation. It's just like all the things that have fallen by the wayside in the last 20, 30 years. The unions and people standing together have fallen by the wayside because something like this is allowed to happen because people are allowed to stand up for their own good, disregarding the good of the people around them. And people have become lazy to stand out on the, on the corner and, and protest. In France, for example, they protest at the drop of a hat. Somebody says they're going to change a couple words in a law and 50,000 people will come out and protest against it. Maybe it's a little overdone over here, but over here it's underdone. But you know? you, you and I good, think it, it, it takes unity. It takes people standing together. It takes maybe getting a group of people and writing a letter to your congressman, writing 50 letters to your congressman, getting on Facebook and putting it up there and letting people know that it's something that you're interested in. Yeah. Now, now, is it laziness or is it our own greed that doesn't allow us to go out there and actually strike or show our unity together? Because, for example, nowadays we have, you know, a lot of people are talking about the gasoline strike that's coming up soon or something like that. And it's all on social media. But people don't do it, though. People don't want to, you know, strike gas. They don't want to go out there and take a day off of work. They don't want to take those days off to show the unity that we really do have. So a lot of times our own greed that doesn't allow us to, to show what we want to do or what, what we really want. It's exactly what unions have lost power. I believe when you're looking at this from like one side of the coin and we're not looking at the other side that's and that's it. that we have our government that's allowing this to happen and a lot of these officials are bought through campaign funds and stuff like that so sometimes you have to actually start from the root and say you know how did this allow how this get was allowed to happen and that started like you said through deregulation and how did that happen that was our government officials letting these things go into effect that allowed them to get out of control so maybe we should start at the root and let that our focus be more on our government putting things back into place that kept them under control for so long. That's good. A, a, a very good point. Young man over here. Has yeah. I think um, all the uh, union members should have this, should read this book because let more people to understand the game than than you know. From your lips yeah. to God's ears. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Um, tonight there's going to be a conference call with Governor Cuomo, who's supporting uh, campaign public financing for all state government elections in New York State, like we have in New York City, public financing of elections to limit the influence of real estate and Wall Street in elections. And that's actually something that we can directly get involved in as uh, citizens in New York State to help lead the way in the country to limit what Juan was talking about, money in elections. Can, let me make one observation here. Uh, let me put a couple of things together. Uh, when that hedge fund guy came after me, it was, it was an interesting thing because it reflected something that I hadn't thought about before, which is how could they be so touchy? What are they worried about? Hey, if I just made a billion dollars on a deal and I didn't get prosecuted, why would I care what a two-bit blogger says about me? I mean, you know, I'm not exactly in the New York Times every week. What I realized was what they're worried about is a popular uproar against them. They're worried that something like Occupy Wall Street is going to happen. Because this happened before Occupy Wall Street when I wrote the article. They're worried that a bunch of people are going to go to the streets and demand their heads on a platter. And they're worried that that could really change things. They're more worried about change than we are about making it. I mean, they have more comp they're, they're afraid that we can do more than we think we can do. So it makes me think that they're vulnerable. Uh, the other thing I just want, you to, want, want to point out to you, I don't know if you remember this, before Occupy Wall Street hit down the street here, the country was talking about austerity, and the grant, there was all this talk in Washington about austerity. Occupy Wall Street hits. The whole conversation changes to the 1%, the 99%, Wall Street. The whole conversation changed. As soon as Occupy Wall Street disappeared, now we're talking about austerity again. So there's power. And it makes me think the next time something like Occupy Wall Street happens, we better be there because it, there's a lot of power there. How to build it? That's why you got people like Sandy around. She'll help us do that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I just want to say something about voting. It's real important. And especially, like, not just like the big ones, like we had a big one. And you'll stand up and address the group, though. Okay, not just the big ones like presidential elections, but you, you know, these congressmen who get elected in the two years in between, who Wall Street lobbies to, to back their little uh, no fees for taxes on their on, on the money that they get we need to not elect them they're coming up for re-election we need to not vote for them and vote for people who are going to take care of working people's interests and um, the the other side you know the the people who buy the homes and get ripped off by these banks and these companies and um we, we, we can do something in power. We just need to do it. It's, a lot of people aren't interested because... I think off of what you were saying about the guy coming after you had the, what, the hedge fund manager, I think not that he was just afraid of an uproar and you turning into a million people. I think one thing that he did that most people on the other side are not doing is he's exercising his right. He has the right to come after you. He has a right. And he's using it. Whether he's afraid or not, he's got money, he doesn't care. But he wants to intimidate you by saying, you know what, I can do this and I'm going to do it. Got my attention. You know, if we all collectively got together as people and we did the same exact thing, because we can. Nobody can stop us from having a rally, you know, or any other function, you know? At the end of the day, we can do whatever it is we need to do to make it happen. The problem with us, most of us, is either we don't have the information, we don't have the finance, or we're just afraid. 
because we're going against a million dollar guy or a billion dollar guy. Good point. Yes. Question, you mentioned that uh, the last time our country was in such an economic disparity was during the Great Depression of 1929, correct? Before, before the Great Depression. Right, before the Great yeah. Depression, you know, which led to the New Deal. You said a series of like government programs designed to create jobs and reform the financial sector and kickstart you know, the economy. You know, based on our economy today, do you think it's kind of like the new New Deal? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I've been struggling with this question, which is why has, been, why has the response been so different after this crash compared to 1929? Uh, because we, uh, it, it's very disturbing. So after 1929, uh, pretty much we jumped in. Yes, you have? I would say back then a lot more people paid attention to what happened around them, whereas now it can be very easily distracted um, with uh, stuff that we have around us. I mean, you know, um, just, it's very easy to just also, I feel like there's, you know, a lot more people that lie these days than back in the day. It's like, it was, it was harder to get away with it back then than it is now. That's an interesting point. It could have been more severe back then, too, because now we have unemployment insurance, you know, right. uh, Medicare, Medicaid, we have, we have this protection. Yeah. We also live in a, a financial uh, system where back then, after the Great Depression, you didn't have money and you didn't have, there was no way for you to get food. So you were, it was a very real, you know, you were hungry, literally and figuratively. But now, now we have we have a, a debt-based, you know, financial system where you're not, even though we know that it's wrong and we know at the end of the day everyone here could still get what they want and you, you're, you're procuring like, uh, you know, make-believe make debt. No one's really hungry like they were back in the 30s and then uh, the 70s when protests well. were, were at their some, Definitely some truth to that. We have time for one more question. Yes. I was just going to say that uh, speaking to the debt-based society, that it's, it's government that's actually set the example for that. I mean, look at our deficit. And, and it is an illusion. We're basically living on this cloud of illusion, and I think maybe that's why it has an effect of us the way it had in the earlier in the last century, is because we have this illusion that everything's okay. You go home, your TV turns on, it's all good. Because you go to sleep, you get up in the morning, you go to work, and you can just use your credit card the next day if you don't have cash handy. It's an illusion. But when it falls apart, what's going to happen then? Unfortunately, the way it looks is it's until that falls apart, not, not much is going to be done about it. Because people will continue to live in this illusion. How many people don't have $20,000 debt in their back pocket? Ah, whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's school debt, or I'll pay it off eventually. But it's, it's there, and it's a fact that we're all living in debt. And until somebody says, you know, this is immoral, this is not the way to live, until one of those countries starts collecting against our government, I don't think much is going to be done about it. Well, we should do another whole workshop on debt. Uh, <laughs> uh, just to leave you, guess how much of the China, uh, guess how much debt the China, uh, of our whole debt, guess how much China owns, owns of our debt? About 80%. 80? Any other guesses? 8%. Guess who owns most of our debt? We do. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, thank you to C-SPAN for, for coming. And uh, I want to tell you, you've got a heck of a dean here. Uh, I've known Mike, as he mentioned, for a long, long time. And he taught me a great deal about writing. As a matter of fact, uh, the thing that he taught that was most important is uh, you've got to put passion in your writing. You can't just be sort of a boring person. You've got to like, let it rip. And he, he actually uh, does that. And I, I have to tell you about one thing that blew my mind. He once wrote a book review about uh, this philosopher, Hegel, who, uh, if you think I'm going to put you to sleep, you should try reading Hegel. And this book review ended uh, with a passionate love scene between being and becoming, which was something this guy Hegel wrote, wrote about. So if you can write with passion, and turn a philosopher's dry words into uh, uh, a love scene, well, you, you can write with passion. So I, I've never forgotten that, Mike. OK, we're dealing with tonight a, uh, let me see if I can uh, get this going here. Uh, why, why write a book like this? Uh, why write a book about earning a million dollars an hour? What I was trying to do uh, are three things. 
I'm trying to raise the most fundamental questions about how economic value is produced by Wall Street elites. What is it? What is it that they do that's so valuable? The second thing I want to look at is what are the root causes of the increasing inequality in our economy? It's, it's the, the gaps between the super rich and everybody else is growing. Where's that coming from? And I wanted to also, the third thing was to kind of revisit the economic crash that happened in 2008 to see if we can get a deeper understanding of what happened. Because uh, uh, I must admit, when I wrote the book Looting of America, I was kind of naive. Uh, I didn't realize what they were really up to. So this book is uh, taking us into uh, new territory. OK, let me start by asking you a question. Uh, what's a fair hourly wage for you? What are you hoping to earn when you become journeyman? What's a good hourly wage? A million dollars <laughs> Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that that's my fee for tonight. So thank you very much, uh, Dean Merrill. Uh, what's, a, what's a good wage for, uh, yeah? $56 an hour. $56 an hour. What do you think? 60. 60? You'd like to get 60? OK. Let's say it's, let's, let's go for. 56 to 60 bucks an hour. Why is someone going to pay you $60 an hour? Why? Yes? Uh, because of the skills that I have to do the okay. job. OK, because of the skills you have to do the job. It's not just the skills you have, right? It's actually applying the skills you have to do the job. So why are they going to give you money? What's in it for them? What? OK, there's risk involved. What else? For the services we provide for them to make profit. Right, the ser you're providing services to them to make profit, yeah? Right, you work hard to develop your skills, to uh, be go through this whole apprenticeship program, including a couple years of college at the minimum. What else, yeah? Right, you're producing a building. You're, you're, they, they can, you know, you're commercial electricians putting up a building. Yeah. You're making money for them as well. You're making money for them as well. Yes. The product that they're going to receive after we finish building is going to be worth ten times as much as the sixty dollars an hour. Right. You're 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 producing a high quality product that has incredible value to the people that are hiring you. Fair enough. Okay. So the mystery we're going to try to figure out. Uh, to, uh, this afternoon is what do the these things called hedge funds produce? But before we get there, let's look at uh, uh, some of the occupations in this country uh, that uh, have the highest incomes and see what it looks like on an hourly basis. Let's start with here are the ten. By the way, the first chapter of this book we put together. Uh, we, uh, we look at, at the uh, wealthiest occupations in the country. So here are the top 10 uh, movie stars from 2010. It takes a while to put a book into production, so those are the latest numbers that we had. You can see uh, Leonard DiCaprio leads the list. Uh, his uh, income was $77 million. You divide it by 2080, right? Number of hours you guys work in a year, and you get to his hourly income was $37,019. Uh, the, the average for that group was $21,298 an hour. The average for the top 10, as you can see, includes you know, Seinfeld and Depp and uh, Adam Sandler. And the bottom of the list is Angelina Jolie. Right? They make a good living. So how do, what do they do to uh, make all that money? How come they get paid so much? Because they have a certain skill that um, provides a profit for the people hiring them. For sure, absolutely. A skill provides a profit for the people hiring them. Yes? I know as a teacher, so they have a lot of bargaining power. There's only one Leo DiCaprio. There's only one Angela. There's that. They have a lot of bargaining power. Anything else? Yes? They sell movie tickets. There you go. They sell movie tickets. So you got, and what's behind the movie tickets? There's a really simple exchange here. We like watching them, so we'll pay to watch them, right? And in exchange, they get money. We get entertainment. We get pleasure watching them. So it's, it's something we all understand. 
do we begrudge them making a, bit, a lot of money? Uh, you know, they, it's kind of fun to watch them, right? We all keep going. We don't go on strike and stay out of the movie theaters. We like, we, we're not protesting over the $10 tickets. We seem to go. Okay, so let's take a look at this now at the top occupations in the country. Uh, uh, let's start at the bottom. Uh, this was from 2010. You can see the uh, uh, bank, uh, top bank insurance CEOs. They were like roughly $8,000 an hour, and we go up to lawyers, authors. By the way, I did not make the top 10 in 2010. I'm working on it for 2013. When Mike gives me the check, I'll get very close. Uh, you got the movie stars. You got your top athletes. By the way, that would be Tiger Woods was number one then. Uh, top CEOs, musicians, top celebrities in general, like Oprah was number one on that list. I was very surprised to find out that the top of this whole group were movie directors. They make more than movie stars. Well, I guess they put the whole thing together. It makes sense. So what we did is we put it, you could see their hourly income. And then there's this thing called hedge fund managers that are like off the charts, $842,788 an hour. That's a lot of money. That's 40 times what the movie stars make. 40 times. What do they do? Work. OK. Let me, let me put another dimension of this puzzle. I, I want you to get very curious about what these people do. Let me make you even more curious. In 2010, the top hedge fund made as much money as Apple. Apple has approximately 700,000 employees and contractors all over the world. The top hedge fund had under 100 employees. So with under 100 employees, they, produce, they supposedly produced as much economic value as Apple with 700,000 employees. What did they do? What did they do for all that money? We ought to be feeling their impact, right? We ought to, they ought to be doing something great absolutely stupendous for the American economy. So where does all that money come from? How is it possible for that much money to exist? I mean, you're hoping to get your $50, $60 an hour, and you're well on your way to doing that, and you'll be worth every penny. Where does all their money come from? Any questions so far? Are you with me? Yeah? Still awake? OK, good. Most of you, anyway. All right. I want you, th th there's only one chart in this whole talk that you've got to grasp and hang on to. And if you do, this chart will do you well for the rest of your life. What we're looking at here, that top purple line is a measure of US productivity. Have you heard the word productivity at work? And people talking about productivity, you know, how much output you put out, they want you to get a certain number of jobs done. Well, if you measure that for the whole economy, what it comes down to is it measures the level of organization, technique, technology, skill that exists in the whole economy. And what's amazing about the American economy is that every year, in the last 65 years, every year except five years, productivity went up. In other words, the amount, uh, the way they measure it is they take the total amount of what we produce and divide it by the number of hours it takes to produce it. Not how much it costs, but the number of hours. So we were able to produce more and more per hour every year. And even the years that it didn't go up, it, it, it didn't go down by very much. That steady line measures the wealth of the United States. Up, up, up. That's why we've got so much stuff. Because, and and you've, you've probably already seen it in your short careers, that new techniques come in. Tell me. Nothing. <laughs> we don't know what they do, do we? We don't know. You go ask anybody what they do, and you're going to get uh, a stare. I don't know. Are we paying to watch them perform, hit a golf ball? We don't know what they do. But they're making way off the list, right? So let's take a look a little closer. What is a hedge fund? Uh, this is a college, right? So you've got to get a multiple choice test. Here, here are your options. A, a wholesale garden supply business that specializes in growing and trimming hedges. B, a mutual fund where anyone can invest that hedges against tough times. C, an investment fund for the super rich and large institutions, by the way, where you need, to, where you need at least a million dollars in wealth in order to invest. A, B, or C? C. All right, it is C. Uh, I didn't make the test hard enough. Uh, I'll talk to your teachers about that afterwards. Uh, 
Okay, so that's what it is. And uh, it's actually for more than just wealthy investors. You've got pension funds that want to get in on the action. Uh, lots of the large banks want to invest in these funds. And these funds are kind of very interesting. The person who runs them gets 2% of the money off the top and then 20% of the profits. So the question then becomes is what do they invest in? How do they play their game? Well, the top hedge fund guy in 2010 made $2.4 million an hour in 2010. That's as much as the average family makes in 47 years. Think about that. One hour of work. Did you go to work today? One hour would equal a family's income, average family, for a lifetime, 47 years. So if you're going to do that in our economic system, you better be producing a whole lot of value for the economy. All those things you just mentioned before about you know, building something that will last for a long time and it's worth 10 times more when you're done because of all the great work you did and the skill you put into it and the, and the, and the uh, service it provides, all that stuff you talked about, it better be true here or we got a big problem. So let's explore that question. Oh, there's another one. The top 25 hedge funds that year, by the way, earned as much as 658,000 teachers who teach 13 million kids. Just giving you a sense of how big these guys were.